Welcome to Revere Asset Management's Your Money with Danny Stewart. The market will always overshoot to the downside and to the upside. And Don Vandenborg. Because it's not how much you make in the markets, it's how much of that you can keep. Who's watching Don's videos? Who's watching Don's videos? Actually, you are because you're watching this, right? But we've got some really exciting news. I'm just going to tell you right here. We really haven't made a formal public announcement. We just found out a couple days ago, but you're listening here. So you're going to find out first on Friday, May 17th, Don is going to be on IBD Live. IBD Live asked Don to come on and kind of show what he's looking at in the markets. And, 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 and he's going to be on live with some of the best traders in the world. So it's going to be very, very cool. So Mark your calendar, and hopefully you may have a subscription to IBD Live. It is a subscription service, but it is fairly, it is very cool, actually. We're actually on it every morning. Now, the Treasury is announcing big Treasury buyback program to ensure liquidity in the Treasury bond market. I thought the Treasury bond market was the deepest, most liquid market in the world. We're going to talk about that. And there's a couple other articles uh, that I have in the mailbag. I mean, in the in the show notes, I'm not going to go into those because they get a little complicated. But uh, your so did your client get Social Security clawback notice? If you are retired and you got a Social Security clawback notice, uh, either call me or there's an article very good there to kind of uh, tell you about the rules and what you need to do. And then there's another article talking about senior housing rebounds as boomers move in and occupancy rates go way up. So during COVID, a lot of those places kind of got a little empty. People were scared to go. Now they're full again, and that sector looks pretty good. Uh, Connor's going to be talking about a few sectors, including real estate. He might touch on that. But before we go into the Treasury buybacks, which is going to be kind of the uh, over-encompassing uh, topic, I want to go to the mailbag first. Okay, so this was from 4-1-MB. A good asset manager is the key ingredient to a secure retirement. Most of us want to live to 100. Wait until you hear how much retirement cost. This is actually from a client. And it's an article in USA Today. I put it in the show notes, and I basically said, me... Bottom line, you must save and invest wisely because the government will not save you. And don't do any income for life, which is really your own money back in dribbles. That was my comment. You can go read the article. Here's one from 5-5, five five, and this is MS, and this is actually to Connor. So Connor got his, uh, I think this is probably his first mailbag. He may have gotten a few before, but Connor, good morning. I want to first compliment you on your great eye for charts. I was made aware of this when Gary Kultbaum mentioned your name on one of his podcasts. I have longed to learn how to find good setups and trade, but never was able to find something that I could stick with. I am close to retirement and would like to generate additional income in and before retirement. Any thoughts or resources that you would suggest as, as a place to learn? Keep up the great work. Thanks and have a great day, MS. Connor Bates. Hi, MS. Thanks for your message and the kind words. For great investing content, I highly re recommend Don's Daily Market Recaps. But apparently IBD Live has been watching. See how uh, a professional portfolio manager operates. Then the book, How to Make Money in Stocks by William Bill O'Neill. Many of that consider many people consider that to be the Bible of investing, active trading. Books by Mark Minervini and Jesse Livermore. If you're ever interested in becoming a client at Revere, I'd be happy to set up a call with myself and my boss to discuss active management, retirement, and estate planning services. Best regards, Connor. And this is my take on this. I didn't actually respond to the uh, uh, person, but my take is regarding, quote, income. That's what they call it, income. That is a term for the IRS to determine tax rate, what tax rate to tax you at or not. It is all about the net, meaning income or returns, you know, net, net growth. It is all about the net, net to you after fees and taxes. But I don't care whether you call it income, capital gains, royalties, dividends, return of principal, etc. It's all about the cash flow, not income. In fact, my preference would be to have cash flow that isn't classified as income, 
because income, the IRS knows how you think incomes at a higher rate. Um, and most people, uh, um, uh, and most people have assets in retirement accounts anyway, so it's all ordinary income when you take a distribution. So don't get sucked into that covered call strategy where you may make some money, but you could have a better strategy that makes more money than a covered call strategy because a covered call strategy can cap the upside. It may not be the best strategy, but you may have more money in an IRA. It's all about how big is the account. That's my take. All right. Now, let's go into this article, and I'm going to read this very quickly. And this is uh, an article from Reuters. Uh, Planned debt buybacks not meant for period of market stre stress, U.S. Treasury official says. The U.S. Treasury, uh, Treasury's planned buybacks of outstanding securities next year is aimed at improving liquidity in the bond market, but it's unlikely to ease periods of extreme financial uh, stress. In a prepared marks for the International Swaps and Derivatives Association Conference in New York, those people scare me. They've got trillions of dollars in derivatives out there. That's kind of what blew up the system in 2008, but I digress. Um, in any event, in prepared remarks for the International Swaps and Derivatives Association in New York, Assistant Secretary for Financial Markets Josh Frost uh, noted the importance of maintaining flexibility in providing liquidity support to certain sectors of the Treasury market. But Frost wanted to make it clear at the outset that these buybacks are not intended to ameliorate for those uh, Englishly challenged, that saw to means to solve or make better. So it's not intended to solve periods of acute market stress. Okay, uh, then why are you doing it? All right, the Fed system, which can can fund its bond purchase. Okay, now. Frost said, unlike the Federal Reserve System, which can fund its bond purchases by creating reserves, that means printing money, each dollar of the Treasury buyback would have to be financed by a dollar of debt issuance. They got to issue debt for each uh, 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 buyback they do. Isn't that like robbing Peter to pay Paul? You're issuing it, then buying it back? It's kind of like Treasury stock. Anyway, this limits our ability to rapidly increase the size of buybacks at a level potentially necessary to alleviate the market stress without resulting in significant cost to taxpayers. Uh, the corresponding rapid rise in debt issuance could significantly increase Treasury's financing costs in a time of crisis. The Treasury announced plans in May to implement regular buybacks in 2024. Here's a key. The last time it conducted regular buyback program was in the early 2000s, and then it ended in April of 20, 2002. Folks, they actually started the Fed buyback program in mid-2000, and they ended it in uh, mid-2002. Anybody remember what that was, 2000? Oh, that was the tech wreck, the bear market tech wreck crash where technology stocks lost about 70, 80% of their value. Anywho, the next year when it re relaunches the buyback scheme, the Treasury said in August that it intends to set a maximum that will allow. It'll initially bend at $30 billion per quarter to purchases for liquidity sp support and $120 billion in the first year of buybacks for cash management purposes. Uh, it's to help improve liquidity. Um, especially off-the-run securities. Now, this should improve the willingness of investors and intermediaries, people like you and me, to provide, and, and the, the uh, bond traders, the treasury traders, to provide liquidity in these securities, uh, all else equal, uh, knowing there is a potential outlet to sell some of their off-the-run securities. In other words, if you buy them, you'll be able to sell them back to somebody. There will be a buyer of last resort, which would be the treasury. Okay, why would you need that if the Treasury's the most liquid market in the world? I keep going back to that. Anyway, the liqu liquidity in the world's largest bond market has been problematic for most of the last year, due in part in rising volatility as the Fed aggressively raised rates. True. Uh, the buyback program will also help Treasury's cash management to reducing volatility. 
during periods of high tax receipts, this is now he's talking about seasonality during the year. During periods of high tax receipts, its cash balance typically rises, like right now when everybody's paying their taxes. And Treasury tries to neutralize that by making substantial reductions in bill issuance. And then he noted the volatility will increase, and then they'll increase the buyer, uh, buyers. Uh, but this volatility can be costly to taxpayers, causing an imbalance. Conducting buybacks during these periods reduces some volatility. Now, here's the question I have. The market is supposed to be so liquid. The Treasury market is supposed to be much more liquid than the New York Stock Exchange. So I'm wondering why they're really doing this. Is it because of China and EU slowing down significantly? The Chinese are having some banking problems, some big, they don't want to tell you that, but they're still having some big banking and real estate problems. Is it the Israeli-Hamas conflict or Ukraine-Russia with all these trade route disruptions in energy? Maybe. Uh, the above are the excuses given, but in my opinion, there's a couple much more important things Japan raising their interest rates and reducing their bond, buy, bond buying is forcing Japan interest rates up. Japan is finally, after 30 years, trying to raise their interest rates, which means the carry trade may be over. Folks, people borrow in yen because the yen is one of the weakest currencies at zero interest rates. They borrow and then they leverage up. In other words, if you're going to go on margin, well, if you go on margin in the U.S., it could be 7 8 9% for a big player like a hedge fund, or for you and me, it could be 10 11% or 9% or even 12 whatever. Well, in Japan, it's almost free. So you borrow free over there, and then you could even buy treasury bonds and make a, a spread on the difference. As long as the interest rate differential and the currency rate differential doesn't make it less uh, attractive. Well, that's exactly what's happening with Japan. So, so that could cause it. Or, or are they worried that this massive new spending, ergo bond issues, so our, our, this budget that, they're, that Biden's tr talking about putting out is $7 trillion. Who's going to buy all those bonds? Do we have enough regular investors on Main Street, even globally, to buy that many treasuries? Or will the Treasury and the Fed have to be a buyer of last resort? Because bonds work like this, supply and demand. So if they put out all these bonds, all this supply, and there's not enough buyers, just think of it, folks. In, 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 when you're buying something, if there's too much supply, that means price goes down. When bond prices go down, that means interest rates spike. So if they don't have a full auction, if they're not fully subscribed, if they're not, if they're, if the, if the, if there's not an, if people aren't buying all these bonds, you're going to see interest rates spike two, three, four percent. If that happens, you really going to have not only a bond market riot, you're going to have a stock market riot. You're going to have all kinds of market riots. That's my personal take, that's what I think is, is could be going on. Now, now remember, when it, in, they weren't worried about a bond riot in 2008 because in 2008, when everything was crashing, everybody wanted treasuries. They were worried about companies and governments, foreign governments, even being solvent. They were worried about U.S. banks going bankrupt. So everybody was flying into treasuries. There was no problem with demand. Here, the problem is there's too much demand. I mean, supply. There's too many bonds being printed. There's, not an, there's too many, and there's not enough to sop up the surplus. That's my opinion. I think that could be a problem. Maybe not. Now, the other thing is, theoretically, if the economy is so good or doing so well, why do we need this at this time? Now, they're arguing about these good job numbers. I don't know if Don has that chart up or not, but so the job numbers came out really, really good. The headline number and what you'll see on the media tonight, the news. Did they tell you that actually full-time jobs lost 6,000 jobs? Lost jobs, not grew less, actually lost 6,000 net new jobs full-time, but the Part-time gained uh, 691,000. So really, when they throw out that 691,000, you can divide it by two, and because two part-time jobs equal one full-time job, and that's really where you can kind of uh, see where the real real numbers are. And by the way, their margin of error is six figures. 
Sometimes their margin of error is bigger than the jobs number itself. The whole point is it is actually not real clear how good the economy is. I think it's government spending that's really driving our economy right now. It's now 30 percent of our GDP. And without that government spending, there's lots of sectors in Main Street that are struggling or even in recession. Now, there's some sectors that are doing very well. I'm not all doom and gloom. The sky is not falling. I am not a perma bear. I am just telling you there are some things under, there's some cross currents underneath that just don't quite jive yet. And I wish I was the smartest guy in the room and could figure out. I just, I, look, I, I don't trust government that much and I don't trust the Fed and the Treasury. And wait, when they say this new big Treasury bond buy, buying program is, is being released and it's just because of liquidity, I don't quite take them at their face value, especially when the last time they did such a big program like this was right during the tech wreck. Just saying. But in any event, it really doesn't matter what I think. What are the charts telling us? Now, we'll go. So if Treasury bonds are the problem, does that mean the flight to quality, the quiet flight to safety, this time won't be in Treasuries? Could it be in gold or silver or Bitcoin? Not Treasuries. I don't know. I just know price is truth. So with that, let's find out what the charts are telling us. So speaking of charts, let's go to Don and the team and let's see what gold, Bitcoin, the sector rotation, because there has been a sector rotation this past week. Is it rotating back into tech? What's going on? So Don, I set the table. Take us home, Mr. IBD Live. All right, Dan, thanks. So I still have this job changes chart up. Uh, that you showed, and it's possible that because very quickly the headline number is what people talk about. But if you look under the hood, the way you just did, and the way we always strive to here at Revere, it could be that the fact that there were really no full time jobs jobs added despite the headline number is why the market's rallying back today. Because although the odds of a rate cut seem to have dropped since that came out. If you look under the hood and you you want to uh, go by the standpoint that weak economic news is good for jo uh, for rate cuts, then this supports that. Um, we do, again, all of this is a secondary indicator, and we go by price and volume first. But uh, that is one one possibility for why why we're rallying as strong as we are today after having that big sell off yesterday afternoon. So I've got the chart of the uh, S&P 500 up and I'm gonna go uh, to a 30 minute chart. We've been talking all the way back since the Fed day on March 20th about how we were staying very bullish as long as the market stayed bullish and it would be as long as we stayed above this 51.74, which was the pivot level when um, the announcement came out to 51.90. Uh, which is uh, kind of a breakaway level if you factor in the pr prior high back in uh, the beginning of March. So we tested it once on April 2nd. Yesterday, uh, Thursday, we had a big gap up because of weak economic data that came out before the open. And then you see this big sell-off, which there were a lot of Fed speakers jawboning about the possibility of no rate cuts yesterday, but it really accelerated to the downside when uh, news hit the wires that the U.S. at 2 p.m. Eastern time was uh, warned Israel about a 48-hour imminent uh, threat from Iran of a retaliation for them killing an Iranian general uh, in, the, in the recent past. And uh, this, looking on a daily chart, we're technicians. When you see, this is by far the biggest bar that we've seen in this, uh, pretty much in this entire uh, range, going back to the, when we put in the bottom back in March, uh, before we kicked off uh, the most recent rally. I'm talking about March of last year, not March of this year. So it's cause for concern. We've got an inside day today. We're having a reasonably good, some would say surprising. I would say surprising. I put maybe a 10% chance of strength uh, of, of a, a bounce this strong on the S&P 500 and leading stocks and the NASDAQ 100. But that's what we're seeing and we're not going to argue with it. The question is, how far does it go? 
Was yesterday really just a one-day massive shakeout? The market will do this during uh, during bull markets. And what we're seeing today is bull market action bouncing back quickly uh, after the market takes the escalator up and then the elevator down. We gave back uh, three weeks of gains yesterday in two hours. And uh, 52.15 is a key level. That is a... Uh, the big the fib retracement of yesterday's high to low if we get above 5215 i think you got to give more credence to the fact that this is a bounce that may be more than just an inflection bounce the 50% level is 5201 so we're watching right now 5201 to 5215 uh, on this bounce right now on the S&P 500 and that's the level that we're in right now and that's the level we're going to keep our eye on anything above uh, this 5215-ish level uh, is healthy. A failure right at this level is typical bounce action, uh, a typical knee jerk after a big sell-off. And if it, you have to watch for it resuming to the downside. Now let's go to the daily chart and look at the S&P 500. We got back above the 21-day moving average at where we had just had a 60 consecutive day streak and 102 days out of the past 103 trading days. One close below it, and now we're back above it. That 21-day uh, moving average right now is at 5180. That 5180 level is right in the middle of that range that I just talked about, that 5174 to 5190. Uh, so an undercut and reclaim of it is uh, bullish. So multiple levels to talk about right here now, and you just take it one at a time and see how things play out because. Uh, Confidence and gains in the market are not all uh, undone in one day. It takes follow-up both to the upside and to the downside uh, to reinforce a move. And right now, we're not getting any further move to the downside. In fact, we're getting just the opposite, a snapback. But the reaction that we did in-house yesterday was because of the change in character. We always respect our stops. We had our stops hit on multiple names. Uh, we did some offensive selling early in the day, and we did some hedging. Uh, to see where this uh, all plays out. And it may take a, a week or two for it to play out. But uh, the initial signs are healthy of, for the bounce back. But uh, the levels, again, 52.15 above there is very bullish. Between 52.01 and 52.15 is a very normal bounce. That's the 50% FIB retracement level. Uh, and 51.90 to the downside is the top of that uh, 5174 to 5190 level and inside there is the 21 day moving average. So there are a lot of key levels there and we just watch how they play out and then we pivot over to how the individual names that we either own or were on our watch list uh, are acting. I'm not going to go through a bunch of those, but I will on the video tonight. And that's what we're looking for. So the changing character that we were uh, fairly certain happened yesterday. We downgraded our short-term trend to neutral from bullish because of the break of the 21 on all five of the major indexes. And uh, that's one day. We, we were looking for follow-up one way or another. And right now, we're not getting follow-up to the downside, which is uh, something that the bulls will be cheering. And this has been an extremely strong bull market. They don't normally die on one day's action. They always have pullbacks. It's just natural. A pullback to the 50-day moving average would be completely normal. Uh, you don't like to see it on a harsh day like we did yesterday where there was just a waterfall of selling. Uh, but, um, you know, some people have nerves of steel and buy when there's blood in the streets. We just re we just stick to our reasonably placed stops. We can always re-enter something if we get stopped out on it. But we're flexible. We'll bend like a tree in the breeze and um, see where the market takes us. So I'm not going to so tell the market where to go. Yeah. So you said that uh, you 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 put it in neutral because all five major indices broke the twenty one. So how do you how do you take it off neutral and back into uh, uptrend or whatever? D does it three of the five have to reclaim the twenty one? All five? What what would that? No, be? we we give more weight. Sixty percent of the weight is to the S and P and the Nasdaq one hundred. Uh, and then we need two closes back uh, above the 21 to get it back onto a bullish posture. Got it. All right. Okay. All right. What do the guys have? So I think uh, uh, Ted's got some things on um, um, uh, telling it all, right? The tape tells it all, Ted? 
Yep. Yes, sir, Dan. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes, we can. Sound great. Perfect. So on the theme of what Don talks about, how we've been with the markets and we're primary technicians, we, we do pay attention to the fundamentals and macro. But what we make sure to do is we corroborate what is happening with the fundamentals and the macroeconomic picture with the trend. And so I wanted to start off this segment with two quotes, one from Stan Weinstein, the tape tells all, which is the title of my segment. I just love, I just love that quick phrase. The second one's from Jesse Livermore. The tape does not concern itself with the why and wherefore. It doesn't go into explanations. The reason for what a certain stock does today may not be known for two or three days, weeks, or months. And that quote is what I want to key in here. In the beginning of March, all of us at Revere started noticing a clear change in character and goal. I mean, all-time highs is definitely a change in character in any asset. And gold, as we have reviewed on this podcast many times, came out of a 10-year cup with handle. And within that 10-year cup with handle, there were multiple cup with handles within cup with handles. I've discussed before, fractals are extremely powerful. And when they do resolve, and break out either to the upside or downside, it can lead to very powerful moves. And that's exactly what happened with gold. And I think we're about 15% up um, from the base breakout. Uh, Don did a really great job participating in gold through the Nugget um, Gold Miners Leverage ETF. So we've caught this move quite nicely. And in the beginning of March, when I noticed this, I, I had a couple tweets and thoughts, some hypotheses of what, the implications of gold breaking out to all-time highs may have met. On the left side, uh, March 4th, I noticed, and I tweeted, gold skyrocketing into all-time highs, meaning there's money looking for more of a defensive posture. Um, and then this is where I noted markets often foreshadow future events. And I said, I wonder what is looming. So this goes back to that Livermore quote of, you don't know why something may be happening in the very moment, but that usually can resolve itself in days, weeks, or months. And the next day I said, gold flying, Bitcoin's flying, crude is reversing. The dollar was setting up in a weekly range as well. Um, all of those have broken out <clears throat> and are acting extremely strong. Um, and I, I kind of just said, I feel like something's going to drop in the news in the coming future and the markets are foreshadowing it. Of course, no idea what that was back in, in the month of March, especially in the beginning of March. On the right side, I kind of just laid out a few hypotheses. I'm not going to narrate all six, but some of those include just our debt problems with the government, deficits, um, high interest expense, 50% of the world's going through an election in 2024, so there could be potential uh, social conflict. There could be another resurgence in inflation or just a simple hedge to the portfolio, especially out of a 10-year breakout. So if you can go on to the next chart, Don, and my initial thought was just the commodities breaking out like gold, silver, copper, energy could have been a harbinger of higher inflation expectations leading to the Fed being more patient. And that's precisely what we've seen. Um, ignore what I said about the 36 and the 60. I was referring to the, only the 25 basis point rate cut. Um, I have the zoomed in photo of the May of the sweat Fox, Fed swaps probabilities for the May um, FOMC, and this was posted, I believe, in February or March. And there's about, there about over a 75% chance, actually more, um, over a 90% chance of what, a cut, whether it's one or two cuts in May, just even a month and a half ago. And if it's a pan to the third chart, Don, I have for this podcast, you can see that this is the updated Fed swaps probabilities for May. And the probabilities now for a cut is almost non-existent with the greatest likelihood of just continue the continue um, for the Fed to continue to hold the interest rates at where they are now. So obviously we can't like take what we've seen now and say it's directly, uh, or we can't say that the price action of commodities and gold directly was foreshadowing this specific event, but if I were to corroborate the trend like what we try to do and try to explain and piece together the puzzle for the price action of certain assets and securities, could say um, that the gold breakout 
was foreshadowing what the Fed speakers and Powell have been talking about this past few, couple of weeks um, with being more patient in cutting rates, monitoring the economic data to see if there's a resurgence in inflation. Um, and that, that's kind of what we're seeing here. And yesterday's uh, gap up and reversal could have been a combination of the hawkishness of the Fed as well as that Iran-Israel news. And actually that Iran-Israel news dropped yesterday. I saw a piece of news that the CIA knew about, knew about it much before. So it does make a lot of sense that institutions get a hold of this information before the public. And they start accumulating what they think is more, quote unquote, defensive. Another hypothesis is what Dan was talking about. And we actually discussed this internally um, on our Revere calls. We talked about that um, there could be something going on because the Treasury was announcing buybacks in a big way. Um, and he talked about this earlier on his segment that there is. Uh, told them that there's not enough demand for the upcoming treasury issues or they're concerned about a liquidity crisis. And then he finally just noted China is struggling and Japan are easing rates. So there's a lot of cross currents and macro can be very, very complicated. There can be so many factors, which is why we primarily focus on the price action and trend of the markets. And that goes back to the tape tells all. And then we try to corroborate what we see and potential reasons with the trend. All right, man. First price, then news. I like it, Ted. Good stuff, Ted. There, you know, every night in the videos as part of the inner asset correlation, I, I take a look at the dollar and gold and silver. And for an extremely long period of time, uh, gold, let's look at the relative strength line. If gold is massively underperforming the S&P 500, there's really no reason uh, to be in it. You're just diversifying into uh, an asset class that's underperforming, and that's not going to help your profits. But looking at this breakout here uh, and the relative strength and how it followed up certainly uh, has to get your attention, and it got our attention. We didn't get into it right off of the jump the way we would have preferred probably because of so many false breakouts uh, that we saw in gold. If you go to a monthly chart here, uh, you can see a false breakout here, a false breakout here, another one here, another one here. And then finally, uh, three months after the fourth failed one, you got one that finally worked. And when we're talking about a breakout, we're talking about going all the way back to 2011. Uh, that's a massive base. Uh, they say the bigger the base, the higher in space. This looks like a just a massive cup with a, a couple of handles in it uh, before the breakout finally stuck. But when an asset class like that finally uh, breaks to the upside, you best pay attention. And you know why? We don't we don't know why. You just go by the tape tells all the reason. It's nice to have a reason. It's part of human emotion to want to have an explanation for why uh, something is happening in the market. Uh, and we, we kind of strive to do that and talk about it in the videos. But the bottom line is you can't override. Uh, you can't override what the actual price action is, no matter what your opinion is. And gold is extremely strong right now. Good stuff, Ted. Let's segue over to Connor. He's going to talk about three sectors and a chart pattern that we saw recently in all three of them. Take it away, Connor. Yeah, so there with with all the volatility yesterday, I thought it'd be good segment to talk about the wedge drop and various different sectors had that yesterday. And I think when the volatility starts to pick up, it's super important that you keep your hand on the pulse of, of different areas of the market. So if you pull up XLRE, Don, so this, this had a wedge drop yesterday, and this was kind of a, as I go into the other sectors, you'll see this common theme, but it, it wedge dropped all the, the 8, 21, and 50-day moving average. And as you can see, they got super bunched up. And when charts get coiled like that, you can't really predict. You, you kind of just have to react to this because it was clearly co coiling for a move. And yesterday, the ca there was the catalyst and it popped to the downside. Um, but some clues that it did give is if you look at that relative strength line, it's been in a clear downtrend. Um, it's trading below that 21 that we use with the RS line. 
and it hasn't really broken out of this uh, cup and handle base. So this sector has been underperforming and it wedge dropped to the downside tomorrow. And with vol volatility picking up, um, I think it's key when you're looking for entries and whatnot is say you're looking to short XLRE. Well, if you did it yesterday, you might be getting stopped out today. So one thing to look for moving forward with this sector is it's rallying back into those moving averages today. And what we're going to be looking for is it, is it going to fail at those moving averages or is it going to pop back through? And that's a similar look that a lot of these different sectors have. And you just have to wait and see what the market tells you rather than predicting um, as majority of sectors are bouncing today. So I think it's going to be key how they react to these moving average clusters. Um, and XLRE is a good example. And if it fouls at those moving averages, DRV, which we've traded before with protection, um, that's always a good option for the real estate sector. And yeah, yeah that's an inver inverse. Good. Yeah, inverse three times real estate, right? Yes, correct. Um, next sector, if you pull up Hack, this is the cybersecurity ETF. And this did something similar. Um, this wedge dropped as well. It lost the 821 and 50 day moving average. But one thing I wanted to talk about this sector is there's been some warning signs. Um, Crowd's been the clear leader. That's the top dog in the sector. It lost its 50 day yesterday, but it's starting to rally back. But if you looked at other names in the sector, there's really been no strength. Um, and a lot of these were propelled off earnings reactions that were to the downside. So if you pull up a chart of Zscaler, ZS, this is a clear laggard in the cybersecurity group um, that, that had the big earnings gap down and it had no sign of a rally. RS line, just straight down. Um, Okta's another one. That actually gapped up on earnings, but it's given the whole move back. And then another name that was very strong was Palo Alto and that's been noticeably underperforming. So Crowd is the strongest cybersecurity stock that I'm seeing. And I think this hack is important to watch because off the follow through day, these were some of the strongest stocks and made some of the biggest moves. And if you've been following us for a bit, you know, Revere handled CrowdStrike pretty well. Um, and given it's a leading sector, it's definitely something to keep an eye on moving forward. And what I'd be watching for is if this hack um, rejects that 50 day moving average and moves lower, that would not be bullish for the sector. And then last one is software IGV. This is another one of the strongest sectors that we've had since the follow through day. And it looks almost, um, carbon copy to, uh, cybersecurity. And one thing I will say, uh, if you pull up a chart of service now, Don, this is one of my, I think one of the leaders in the sector and that's showing great RS today, that's wedge popping those moving averages. And as you can see, they're all, all stacked together. So sometimes when you get a pop, when they're all coiled like that, it can lead to a trend. And what's Don's pointing out, big change in character for the RS line today. And that's kind of what you want to see when a stock is making a turn out of a consolidation. Uh, the notable laggards in the group um, workday, that's been very weak. Uh, that had a ne another negative earnings reaction and hasn't been able to rally ever since. Um, and then, yeah, that just looks like it's moving lower from a bear flag. And then another one is um, Adobe. That's really had no strength. And that's trading below the 200 day moving average. So ServiceNow is the leader in the group and it's always important to watch the leader along with the ETF to give you a, a bigger picture. But I think moving forward, the, the recap on all these sectors is they had the wedge drop yesterday. They're rallying back into the moving averages. So what direction they're gonna take, we have no idea. We're just gonna follow price and, and let price tell us. Um, and these have been, software and cybersecurity have been two of the strongest sectors since the fall through day. So they're, they are very important. Yeah, money money has to flow somewhere. We've been talking in the nightly videos about how uh, the tech leaders and that uh, took the baton 
uh, and led the way off of the November follow through day had been showing lagging relative strength over the past month. And you saw Ted talk about gold. That was one that took the baton from those leaders and went to the upside. There's always sector rotation going on. And that's why we're big proponents of keeping a core, uh, a core holding in uh, the S&P 500 via leveraged ETFs. And then when the market is in your favor, look for those stocks that are far outperforming uh, to put alpha in your portfolio uh, with a uh, stop sell rule, uh, strong uh, risk control stops in place whenever you buy something, but you really need the market uh, at your back in order to take advantage of that. Uh, and when the market is going sideways, that sector rotation allows you to, it keeps you, if you're all focused in tech, it keeps your portfolio from way underperforming. And that's one of the key tenets of William O'Neill is you don't need to get your sector rotation or your uh, diversification from bonds or from foreign stocks or from emerging markets. You get it within the leading sectors uh, within the overall market. And that's the that's the approach that we take here at Revere. So good stuff, guys. Appreciate that. Dan, I think that's about all we have. The market is hanging right around that 5215 level, uh, which is the 61.8 Fib retracement of yesterday's range and uh, acting as a little bit of resistance when we get to this level, which is kind of normal which way we break into the close is going to be more important. It's uh, 1230 Eastern time uh, right now. And as always, we'll, uh, we'll update it in Friday's video. All right, Don, thanks. Connor, the web, uh, the uh, wedge meister. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, right. folks. Uh, listen, w the question I have is, you know, today we're talking about price first, then news. Is your advisor just an asset allocator giving you a pie chart and then rebalancing at some arbitrary date? Because if he's doing that rebalancing model, a lot of times he's picking the weeds, picking the flowers to water the weeds. What you want to do is keep culling any weeds that pop up right when they're very small, their little sprouts, and let the flowers grow. Anyway, if you liked what you heard, please tell a friend, tell a neighbor, just send them to revereasset.com. Up in the right-hand corner, there's a subscribe button. They can go ahead and put their name and email address in. We're not going to hassle them or spam them. It's up to them to reach out to us to uh, for a complimentary portfolio review if they want a stock in their portfolio looked at uh, or they got a, a topic they want discussed. There's also a comment button or a uh, 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 you know, reach out button, the comment button, if they want, or you can just send me an email directly, dan at revereasset.com, and we'd be happy to answer any of your questions. You can also email don at don at revereasset.com, connor at revereasset.com, or ted at revereasset.com, and you can always, always all call us old school at 855-REAL-WEALTH. Don't forget to watch Don if you can. They're running a, a special on IBD Live for, for what is it, three months, Don, for $99? Yeah. No, $9. $9.99. $9.99. $9.99. Three for, months for 10 bucks. Wow. Wow, folks. And Don will be on there on Mar Friday, March 17th. May 17th. May, May 17th. I'll get it right one of these times. Folks, next Monday, the eclipse right around 1. So be careful if you're driving down the highway and everything goes dark for a couple minutes. Don't get spooked. It's not, the, it's not revelations. It's just the eclipse. We'll talk to you next week on your money. Because it's not about how much you make in the markets. It's about how much you can keep. <laughs>